this is kind of a question around like networking in general right or whenever you do content or whether you do anything in business it's about being memorable a way i've decided to do that is because i wear a hat because of how i dress but the question i always have is are they integral to you when i started wearing hats it was partly because i want to wear hats also because i was self-conscious over the fact that i'm bold there's times where people ne- it was funny i'll tell you a quick story i went to networking a couple of weeks ago i entered the room without a hat on half the room said where's your hat <laughs> well welcome to the power to speak the podcast with my guest for this edition is carlton brunton of uh of Brunton Media. So you are the managing director, you're a videographer, and what Brunton Media does is video production and working with people on their content. So why don't you start, Carlton, by just explaining a little bit about what what you do at Brunton Media. Absolutely. Thank you, firstly, Jackie, for having me on. Um, it's great to be here. But what we do here at Brunton Media is basically we take uh, the ideas that you have in your head and we help them articulate them on video. Um, because video can be very scary, it can be very intimidating to do, but we help articulate or help you articulate what you're going to be and who you help and how you help them. Because I think video, especially in the you know more recent years, has been something which people have wanted to do but has struggled to actually be able to do in the same way with what you do, which is speaking in front of crowds, of course, as well, which is something which is this kind of really wanted thing to do. But how do we go about doing that in such a way where it allows us to come across well, come across confidently, come across cohesively and uh, be able to actually share all this knowledge that we have got, gained through our lives and our experiences doing what we do. So yeah, that's what we do. Absolutely. And as you said, it's something that I've certainly found in lockdown, lockdown and also just I think in general, we were kind of coming to this space where people are kind of expected to show up for their audience you know whoever it is that they want to attract to their business their clients customers are kind of expecting to see them to hear them and so what I do with around speaking and presenting is you know as valuable now more more so than it than it actually ever has been and i think it's the same with video as well so how how has it changed since the pandemic and in the last few years for you as a as a videographer i mean uh, pre pandemic it was very kind of you create a promotional video you created some random content you did corporate interviews and there wasn't this emphasis the emphasis on short form, short form, short form, short form, short form, short form, right? Because TikTok was around and short form was around, but it wasn't as dominant as what we saw in the rise of through the pandemic of TikTok and then Instagram Reels, YouTube shorts, etc. Because it was one of those things where TikTok really started gaining its own when people had time to spend looking at stuff on they wanted to be entertained because they didn't want to uh i guess the best way to articulate it would be they didn't want to look at the real world so they had to have a final way to escape right this is why we saw huge amounts of people go into video gaming uh and or content creation and or content consumption and i think for me tiktok was a very clear example and the reason why i use tiktok talking about short form is because they were the ones who really made it the popularity that it has now they're the reason why the instagrams the facebooks the googles etc of the world actually want short form to exist so in answer to the question really simply it's about really creating post content stuff from something long form like this into those shorter bits to be part of your lead gen to link out to people going to the podcast or website or webinar etc yeah. wherever you want to send them yeah i mean you, you've touched on it there with the short form form but just for for those people that are listening that don't really understand this you know huge explosion in tiktok and you know i think people feel that if they're going to make anything for tiktok then it needs to be silly they need to do a dance they need to mm. lip sync lip sync they need to do something that it doesn't feel very business like so can you explain a little bit deeper what a short form video is in comparison to a long form but also if you are a business owner how can you use the short form format for a platform like tiktok which now the demographic for tiktok is a you know the age the age range is a lot higher than anybody would imagine you know i think it's it's up into you know the 40 year olds are sort of the mm. biggest demographic demographic mm. of, of tiktok these days 
Yeah, I mean, short form is like short form video just really hasn't actually, this isn't the first time we've seen it be really popular. Um, you know, we're both of the ages of remembering Vine when it was a when it was a thing, right? And it was the first time where really short form storytelling and short form skits and short form entertainment was really, really valuable. But in answer to the question directly around the misconception that TikTok's just for dancing and lip syncing, Lip syncing mostly, but also dances, it was when it was Musical.ly. Because those who don't know, Musical.ly got bought out by the guys who own TikTok. And that's what Musical.ly was for. It was designed and it was something that I grew up with, which was lip syncing and dancing. But when it got when it transitioned to TikTok, yes, it still had that emphasis and still had that element for the younger generation. But what ended up happening was what TikTok called community talks or a set of uh, videos and a set of creators creating videos around filmmaking, creating videos around speaking, creating videos around what it takes to be a lawyer, what it takes to be a chef, what it takes to be X, Y, Z. And what ended up happening was it became a distribution platform for people who were thought leaders or wanted to become thought leaders, right? Because the difference between a business owner and a thought leader is basically, do you articulate your thoughts? That's the only real difference between the two, right? Business owners themselves, we have this ability to be able to fix people's problems, but something which is really powerful and really important is can we articulate it to the right audience at the right time so that potentially they choose to buy from us and how do we you know one of the age-old questions of how and why do we market is so that we can get more work right yeah absolutely but how and, and i'm talking i suppose from personal experience because obviously with what i do people want to be able to show up on lots of different platforms confidently and with clarity and to get their message across how then do you uh, put yourself across as a thought leader in under a minute so, I mean, the, the, you don't actually have to do it necessarily under a minute. It's about understanding how you can create ed, post-edited content to fit inside that world, number one. Number two, because I would never recommend someone starts with how do you share a really important point in one minute? Because that takes a lot of skill. That takes a lot of practice. That takes, to an extent, quite a bit of editing as well. Because the way to do it is actually condensing time. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I have a, this is using the long form into short form analogy. Um, let's say I have a workshop or a podcast like this. I have golden moments or golden sections that are mid conversation that are really, really good. And I really articulate a point that happens to be around a minute. Okay, I can take that out. And now I've got a minute position or a minute piece of content that really positions me as that expert. And I think for me, you can go about, of course, creating the one minute video if you wanted to. But the thing is with the one minute video is it takes a lot more than one minute to create. Right. So if you're going to do it as a proper skit or a proper like production based video, not necessarily meaning you have to have a production team, but doing it in respect to the thought process that goes behind creating the production. The simplest answer I would give to that, though, to get people to started is think of a question and then answer it and only give yourself a minute to answer it not necessarily film it right away but just set a timer and see if you can answer that pain point that you have for your client in one minute and if you start developing this skill set what will end up happening is you'll be able to you'll work out what words are not necessarily that valuable and add to the point that you're trying to say and what words do and it allows you to be able to actually come across a lot better because you're not going to have filler words, right? You'll know this in the speaking world. The reason why we um, are, er, er, et cetera, or even say words that maybe are fluffed is because we are nervous or concerned about how we are being portrayed. And a technique which I teach my clients when it comes to coaching on video is the pause technique. So whenever you think you're going to take a moment or take a worry or etc you think you're about to say like or are etc just take a breath in don't say anything keep eye contact with the camera and if you want to you can then post edit that out if you want to for the video but in a presentation environment that can give your audience an opportunity to reflect on what you just said because otherwise your entire presentation becomes like this and you're really really talking really really fast and then you're not going to be able to breathe and you need to slow down sometimes and you can play around with how fast you end up talking and developing your own rhythm with what you're articulating. So you can put more or less emphasis on some of the things you're saying. And uh, yeah, absolutely, that's exactly what I 
I teach people too is is it's it's better to slow down to allow not only your own brain to to keep up with your mouth and what you're saying but it it gives your audience a bit of a breather a bit of time to actually take in what what you've said so yes yeah, certainly when people are practicing it's it really is about finding those moments when you can stop and breathe and obviously if you forget something that's also a good way of of just making sure you've got time to to bring back your own thoughts and get yourself focused again but I love the idea of answering that question in one minute I think that's a really good piece of advice because I think that's a really good way that people can answer that question it's you know you can quite easily do that in 30 seconds a minute you know and and really sort of hone in what it is that you you are trying to get across um so how then has your business adapted for this kind of post-pandemic world? How have you changed? What were you do? What, were you doing exactly the same thing beforehand that you that you're doing now? I think that you know, for me specifically, I've learned to actually have more strategies of or more things I can offer our clients than just one. Because traditionally, before the pandemic, we were just a sole video production company. We were just look, we are the guys you hire to do a promotional video or do your corporate interviews or cover your event, right? But for me, I was like, okay, I'm in a position where quite literally you couldn't make, you couldn't go out and make videos for three months. It was illegal to do so. So you kind of was like, or the, or the, or the logic around it was really, really vague. It wasn't hundred percent. Yes, you can do this. So it was kind of, for me, I was like, okay, how can I take the skill set and the knowledge that I have to create valued based pricing stuff or value stuff? that can really help articulate people's messages still because marketing doesn't stop just because the pandemic happens or marketing doesn't stop or shouldn't stop just because, you know, the challenges we're seeing now with people, you know, struggling, whether that's financially or they're concerned about their mortgage or et cetera. And I think it's been a, one of these situations and I've been saying a lot in, in one-to-ones and conversations I've been having at the moment, which is like, you have to become a good operator, but also you need to appreciate and understand that it's okay to pivot and it's okay to, and you need to understand when you can pivot and when you should pivot. That doesn't mean I don't do video production. That just means I'm pivoting into saying, hey, I actually do this as well. Hey, I can help you actually use your food to use your phone and you get access to my brain without having to, it to be tied to production money, right? Necessarily. Because actually I can help more people by doing that because I'm kind of breaking up my service offering into multiple different chunks instead of being this like, if you don't have production money, I can't help you. Okay, so you are you're working more in a in a kind of a more of a, a smaller way in that you can reach more people because I know you've you've been out there now doing sort of workshops in person, mm-hmm. um, and and what are you teaching when you when you walk into a workshop space? So the first thing that I I do in our workshops is I I help people understand that it doesn't matter whether you have a production crew, a phone, or all of the resources to create content in the world, if what you're going to say when you create the content isn't valuable for your audience, you shouldn't be creating the content. And that's what we spend the first half of the workshop working on, is helping business owners or people in the workshop understand why they should create content in general. What's it actually going to do? What is it? What problems is it actually going to fix? Either for them or for their clients or how does it potentially get them more clients or how do they move to the point where they can be in demand for what they do even if they are already really busy why should they be still creating content now because i think sometimes we look at marketing or content or etc and we're really busy and we're like well should i don't need to create content because i've got the work but the question i always ask back is okay but what are you going to do to get more work potentially in three months six months 12 months or if you ever want to up your prices or if you want to grow you're suddenly then going to not be very busy, right? So how are you going to continue to have interest and how are you going to continue to have people who potentially are quite likely to go, yeah, Colin, let's let's work together. I want to do some work with you. So what is then your recommendation to how much people should be curating, creating for their own business? I mean, does it make any difference whether you're a big business compared to a solopreneur? To be completely honest, I mean, you should be creating in relationship to what size you are, right? Like a corporate will have more resources or more 
ways or more things that they can create content around and more people and more editors potentially and more ways to get productions to happen than a smaller business. But that also doesn't mean that the small business should just go, now nah, let's not bother. Because for me, it's actually about creating an opportunity where the small business owner can actually take market share from those larger businesses or from necessarily from the ones that they can't have that personal connection with. Because the reason why you go with someone who's smaller or et cetera is number one, you may be able to afford their pricing. Number two, you might be in a position where actually you want to have that personal connection with them and you want to be able to actually get to know them as a person, as a solo entrepreneur, more than, oh, I'm meeting this corporate company who's corporate and faceless potentially. Right. So how how do the smaller businesses with video specifically take away some of that that bigger brand share? Would you recommend them doing something surprising, outrageous? I don't know. How how would you? You. Uh, I mean, there's no like there's no magical bullet, so to speak. It's about creating stuff that's authentic to your personality. So if you're quite an outgoing person, if you are quite edgy, so to speak, in the respect to how you articulate yourself, then actually you doing shock marketing tactics will be on brand for you and will work for you. So for me, because of who I am, quite energetic and my energy, that will be what people kind of expect from me, right? That's what they expect. That's what they see. That's what they believe in. But if you're quite more mellow and you're quite cautious and, you know, maybe you don't swear a lot and you're not very boisterous and et cetera, and you're not very kind of like energetic as a brand, as a, as a person, then maybe your approach shouldn't be shock marketing or, 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 you know, potentially aggressive marketing, not as in the content, as in the approach you take with your marketing. It's about putting something that makes sure that's in line with your business, your growth, your reality and making sure that you understand why that connects with who you're trying to connect with as well. Because as your audience will know, because they've listened to your content, it's not about me when I create content. It's about the audience that's going to consume it. It's about mm -hmm. the people who I'm talking to. So in this context, it's how can I help everyone who's watching this get, at, get something out of our conversation? Right. How can I help them understand or help them believe that video is not this obtainable thing? It is something which they can do and they should do. Yeah. So how do you approach your own video marketing then? Do you have a do you have a presence on TikTok? Do you do the, the sort of the very short form videos? So we I mean, uh, like every business, I think you should be constantly evolving and changing what you're doing. And if you're getting comfortable in what you're doing, then it will become less effective. But at the moment, what are we doing is creating short form bits of content that are potentially clips from a uh, you know workshop, as you alluded to earlier, our own podcast, potentially, or conversations or meetings that I've had that I've then used or created the, the content from having that conversation. And we're distributing that in smaller chunks so it can be consumed easier than me giving you an hour conversation that you might find really valuable but potentially are less likely to you uh, less likely to consume in one go so it's about creating as i say creating that content in a way which is consumable for the audience but also very valuable for the audience when they do consume it now as i say you should always balance and predict and change how you're going to go about creating a content and making sure that it's something which is going to connect but also style wise you're also changing as well, because if you're doing the same thing, expecting different results, it, that's the definition of insanity, right? So if you want to continue to grow and you want to continue to adapt, we should, you know, like every three to five, three to six months, I look at what is our methodology regarding creating content and how can we up it to the next level? And what am I seeing in the market? So, for example, there's been a shift from in the video space, there's been a shift from just taking clips on their own with subtitles and actually now adding in graphics and images and other videos on top which is actually a lot more work from the editor's point of view but from an engagement point of view it's actually potentially for some people quite distracting but for others it will always hold your attention because there's something changing on screen so something that we're going to be trying soon 
which is an exclusive because I've been thinking about it and I've just made the decision today that I'm going to do it, um, is actually adding in those graphics and adding in those images onto the short form bits of content. So I'm going to see, okay, so we've done short form with just subtitles for three, four months. Okay, what does me adding these images, me adding this extra bit of effort into editing mean in regards to the results that we are now able to produce? And what does that mean for our clients, right, as well? Because I use my accounts as test beds for stuff to say we're going to try it and see what happens. But then that might be seen by either some of our clients at the moment or new clients and say, hey, look, I love that. Oh, my God, I love that. That's really cool. Can you help us do that? Can you help us do that as well? So you're putting stuff out there and and showing people what is possible to do. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously you have come from a video background yourself i mean the whole kind of gaming thing i think you you were part of back in the day how yeah. did, how has that helped you what did you do back then what was it that you were involved in so for the audience's context point of view i mean i started my career in video as a uh, let's play or a youtube gamer that co- documented his process in wanting to become a professional gamer right so from the age of 12 to the age of 15 i wanted to be a professional world of warcraft player um, and I had some success with that and I had some viewership and et cetera. And I built a system that really worked for YouTube content creation in, in, in World of Warcraft at the time. And, you know, we gained good momentum and et cetera. I understood that YouTube was really starting to become a search engine more than it was anything else. So how do I leverage that now? I can now, because I've done video since then, I'm in a position where I can talk to clients from a place of care, but also from a place of knowing to say, okay, this is how you can leverage YouTube. The way we look at YouTube is not the same as we would look at social media. Yes, it is a social media platform, but it's treated as a search engine. It shouldn't, and actually arguably TikTok is becoming, if it isn't already, should be treated as a search engine as well. E.g., when you create your content, you should create it with the title, description, and tags in mind so that you're coming up in a search result point of view because it's le- it's actually becoming more about interest-based marketing more than, hey, I follow Colton, so I'm going to, be, I'm going to get distributed Colton's content because actually social media is moving away from followers and more around, I love filmmaking or I love this. I'm going to now get served this as content. Ah, yes, that's very, that is interesting, actually, because I think a lot of people of a certain age, of which I am one, um, you know, I've I've got a, a, a late teenage daughter who has introduced me over the last few years to YouTubers and guys that are out there making money from their content on YouTube. And, and it, for me as a business owner and somebody that's marketing myself, it's, you know, trying to work out how to use these platforms as a way of marketing that, you know, we are not left behind by the youngsters that are out there doing something that, you know, we don't know how to access or get involved in. So mm-hmm. actually seeing it as a search engine, I, I think that's a, that's a, another good way of looking at it, which is kind of where the SEO comes in, which again, kind of baffles people. So is that something that you talk to people about as well? It's definitely something we will advise on. Personally, we don't, we won't actually do it for people because it's it's very time consuming. And and I think actually the value is in the person that we're coaching to actually learn how to do it themselves. Because then you're not tied to having to be me or tied to having to work with us all the time, right? Because the thing is, if you don't have a skill, and this is why I always recommend people start it doing themselves. If you don't have a skill, you can't then check if the person you're hiring is any good, right? If I didn't know how to create content, I couldn't then outsource content creation because I don't know what's good content to start with. And also, it's not very fair because the people I'm outsourcing it to, I don't know how to give them critical feedback on how we can make the content better because I don't know what's good because I haven't done it, right? It's the same with anything you do, podcasting, speaking, uh, Facebook ads, etc. All these things should be something you have a basic understanding of so you can gauge whether they're any good or not so you recommend people go in and look at youtube and look at tiktok and just see what other people are doing and play with it really yeah you just, should be yeah. you should be a consumer before you're a creator right and actually there is even a level of even when you are a creator 
that you should be consuming, right? I spend some of my time on TikTok still because I want to see what the trends are. Not so necessarily that I can trend Jack, but so I'm aware of where, what filmmakers are creating, what styles, how are they doing it? I mean, how else would I know that people are using pictures and images and et cetera on their videos more consistently than they were, say, six months ago? Yeah. Because I'm sat there watching it on TikTok and I'm looking at it on Instagram and I'm so on because a lot of people follow the same model that we do, which is you create one portrait masterpiece of content that then gets distributed to all of the channels. It's not actually, it's actually really, you only really create one video and then you optimize it for each place. Right. So you kind of adapt it. You, yeah. you see what's going on on that platform. And, and I mean, I like the uh, the trend jacking idea is that you you go in and you you're kind of looking for what is on trend and you're you're utilizing it borrowing it adapting it for yourself it's about yeah it's about being i mean for a long time it kind of is a pros and cons but for me you can do that if you want explosive growth the issue is you won't necessarily get any clients from it because the people you're going to get from trend jacking are just people who are getting served to you because of the trend. Now you might win and you might win the lottery and get some people who actually need what you sell. But the thing is, it's actually better in my opinion and from the people I speak to who do it as well to create organic content and ignore trends because then you're not going to like, I, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a real life example. I had an event video that went really viral on my YouTube channel like a year ago. I privated it, even though it was like climbing a, a thousand views a day. And the reason why was because the people, those thousand views weren't the audience and weren't the people that I was looking to connect with and I was looking to talk to. If it was a video that was like, here's how to get the most out of your video marketing strategy, and it was gaining a thousand views a day, it would be like, yes, that's incredible. Because the only people searching how to get better video strategy are people looking for video strategy or video, which means they're all potentially ideal clients. So if a video is getting a thousand views a day, it's very possible that one or two of those people are in the right space to actually want to buy from me because if they consume that piece of video it might start a conversation which then in turn means they might want to buy from me right would you not say though that that you just just let it run even you know if you're getting as many because is it a bit of an ego thing i mean i do know somebody that's um quite big on instagram but she she is a copywriter and she put out a um a post on how to make um, I don't know, a chocolate brownie in two minutes or something and got millions of, I mean, literally well over a million views. Mm -hmm. And she she said it was just probably the worst thing ever, but I couldn't understand why that is. I mean, she wrote a blog as to <laughs> the pros and cons because of it's... that viral. But if surely if you're, if you're target, if you're hitting an audience of that size, you're going to pick up some people that are relevant. Yes, I know. I mean, you're at the luck stage there, but what percentage of that million is going to be people who are want are going to want copywriting services, right? Would you rather have like I'll give you an example. I would personally rather have a video that got a hundred thousand views, not a million, but the video that got a hundred thousand views was exactly the niche I'm in and exactly the solution and the problems I resolve. Or in your example these are all the people who like it. This is why copywriting is not dead in 2024, for example, right? One that will probably be written and probably taken as content in the next couple of years, right? Will be why is X not dead in the year we're in, right? The reason why that's powerful is because you're saying, hey, this is the buzz thing. Like, for example, I'll probably make a video at some point in the next year saying why short form is not dead, right? Because short form is now becoming the popular thing. So sometimes you want to actually point and say, actually, yes, it's popular, but it's still valuable to do. And the, using your brownie analogy, what kind of audience is that million made up of? It's actually probably people who care about cooking and care about making and care about crafting, right? In respect to like, how do I make X thing? Now, if she was a page that was like, hey, I sell recipes, I sell aprons, I sell cookbooks, I sell this, that would be incredible for her because it's exactly the audience she wants to attract. As she isn't, or maybe, I think mean, this is a question of do you pivot into doing that after you see that success? Different mm -hmm. conversation, right? But as she's not that, and as she's a copywriter, actually that's going to hurt her brand because she's got what we're going to describe as dead followers because people might follow her wanting that content, 
that she's not necessarily going to want to make that content herself because it doesn't feed her business. And this is the conversation we have all the time about vanity metrics in regards to do you want views, likes, or, or subscribers, or shares, or do you want clients, right? doesn't matter if my video gets 10 views as long as the nine of the views are the right people because then I'm moving my business forward. I don't particularly yeah. care whether it gets 10 views or 100 views. It's about or, or 90 bits of interaction or 100 bits of interaction. It's more about who's interacting and why, right? Yes, you want more, but you will only want more of the right people. Yeah, yeah. No, that that does that, that does make sense. Um, does it... I'd like to talk about personality in mm. in your content because I think that kind of comes back to, and it's a lot of what I talk to people about is about showing up with their personality because I feel that if you show up with some personality of your own that you're not sort of taking from anybody else, then you will attract people to your content that are like you and that are more likely to buy from you, trust you, relate to you, you know, all of those things. Obviously, I mean, you are known, I know you as the man that wears hats. So is that something that's become part of your brand? And do you, is that something you recommend to other people is to find something that makes them stand out? I mean, this is kind of a question around like networking in general, right? Or whenever you do content or whether you do anything in business, it's about being memorable, right? A way I've decided to do that is because I wear a hat, because of how I dress, because I come across, Right. But the question I always have is, are they integral to you, right? When I started wearing hats, it was partly because, okay, I want to wear hats. It's also because I was self-conscious over the fact that I'm balding. Okay, that's life. That happens, right? I now, by the fact I can have this conversation, clearly it doesn't matter. I don't particularly care, right? There's times where people... It was funny. I'll tell you a quick story. I went to networking a couple of weeks ago. I entered the room without a hat on. Half the room said, where's your hat? Right. So that just proves the power that it will be part of your brand eventually if you choose it to be. But it, it's also about why specifically do you want it to be and what does that mean for me? It, and it's something that I'll foreshadow to coming in the new year. It's actually going to be something I now leverage because it is becoming such a prominent part of Brunt Media. Right. It's becoming prominent in respect to Colton's the one that wears a hat. OK, fine. But. Again, how can you either leverage that if you want it to be, or how can you? Because eventually, like, let's say, for example, I wake up tomorrow and I go, actually, I don't want me wearing a hat to be affiliated with Brunch Media. Okay, don't wear a hat for six months. It will no longer be affiliated to the brand. So was that, really. But how can you use it to become memorable and how can you actually leverage the things that happen? Because it was a complete accident, right? It was just complete accident that I ended up wearing a hat more consistently, which then meant people latched on to Colton wears a hat and it's part of the brand. It's now become a joke and it's now become something that I leverage. But I made that choice to make it something that was an asset instead of something which was just there that's kind of nothing, you know. And I think it's about being, you know, one of the reasons why I dress the way I dress and one I would suggest people do think about how they dress is not necessarily the... Uh, short term, oh, this person's thinking I'm successful or not because of how I dress, but it's also the the memory you leave them with and how you how the, you help them feel. We talked a little bit earlier about your content. If you're coming across in such a way where you are dressed in a sense of authority, e.g. wearing a suit, a dress, etc., that positions you as an authority figure, you're probably going to be taken more seriously than if I show up in a T-shirt and jeans, for example, right? Yeah. It's also the fact that I actually really enjoy wearing the kind of clothes I enjoy, I wear, right? That's a bonus. That's a benefit. Great. Fantastic. And it's not necessary. You don't have to, right? You can, you know, there's lots of examples of people who are very well established in their niche that, you know, wear jeans, that wear a T-shirt, that wear a hoodie, etc. right? It's not like you have to literally wear a suit to be taken seriously, but it does help especially yeah. when people don't necessarily know you and they're just taking you at first glance look unfortunately you know yeah. but is it is it also to do with confidence that you know the what you you're wearing what makes you feel comfortable and therefore yeah. that's what you're putting across to the world is that you are comfortable in your own skin that you're comfortable in your own personality mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, for me specifically, I know there is a correlation between me wearing a suit and me being more confident. 
there is definitely a correlation there. Now, that's for me personally. It might be something very obvious. Like some people I know wear shirts and they go, oh, this doesn't feel right. I don't like it. Okay, well, don't wear a shirt then. Right? Wear something that you feel more comfortable in. I know so many, I mean, the, the traditionally creatives are known for T-shirts and jeans, right? But the thing is, like, I deliberately took that and span it on its head to say, actually, I want to be the creative that's perceived as the expert because of how I dress and because of how I take myself seriously, right? And one of the things that I coach people on is actually getting them to take their own content seriously. And if that means you have a slightly more articulated character with more energy, et cetera, when you're on a podcast show or a conversation piece like this, or you're creating content, great. Or it's in the position where it's how you dress. It's how you come across. It's how you, you know, do you wear hats? Do you not wear hats? Do you have your hair in a specific way? Do you have, your, you know, do you dye your hair? Like this notoriously known as streamers, for example, they'll dye their hair a neon color just because it makes better content, right? And that's their livelihood. There is a tangible transactional reason behind their hair color, right? You know, it's kind yeah. of up to, it's up to you. And the, the advice I would give is make sure you do stuff that's integral to you because it's yeah. very easy to sometimes fall in the trap of, oh, I got loads of likes because I, I wore a suit in this photo, for example, right? But if that's not integral to you, then it doesn't matter because you'll eventually quit doing it or not wanting to do it because you'll just kind of go, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good, etc. And it's not something you're going to hold the consistency where it actually will work for you. The reason why I can wear a suit all the time is because I enjoy wearing a suit in general yeah. or I enjoy wearing a hat, for example. <laughs> it's, the, it's the suit hat combo as well. Well, I know you more for waistcoats, I have to say, rather than I don't think I've ever actually ever seen you in a suit jacket. So it's a, it's the waistcoat and the hat. Yeah, you see, it's but brand. it is brand, and I you know I don't particularly have one. I suppose maybe maybe the well the blackboard. I think well that's not me. But again, it's about creating these aspects or these uh, things that are, are add-ons or additions to your brand. Your brand is actually you. It's your, as a, what comes out of your mouth and who you are as a person, how you come across. But it's how much other memorable stuff can you add in. So do you have a whiteboard? Do you do you know people see a lot of my office so maybe they know me because of my office but when i change my office that will change and that will be you know this will then be the chapter of you know that office or etc and you know etc in the same way if you go further back you can have the chapter of when cotton made content in his room right mm -hmm. like it's the same but that's the power of content you're trying to tell a story and tell that journey and i'm very proud of the fact that i can tell that story and i can show you videos from over 10 years ago that have me curating that and have me having those conversations. Yes, it was about something else. And yes, I wasn't necessarily there, but it's still me creating content, which gives me a huge amount of credibility when it comes to me talking to you about what your content you're creating, yeah, yeah. because I have literally done it for 12 years, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's this thing now that we are, we're very, very used to seeing inside people's spaces and so we connect the people that we see with kind of what's going on around them and how they dress mm -hmm. themselves for the camera, for their audience. I mean, how comfortable are they? How authentic are they? How, how confident are they? We can kind of see because it's not like being on a stage. It's, it's a similar, you know, when I was acting, I was stood on a stage as an actor. I didn't do a lot of stuff on camera. And so I never saw myself. I never, you know, I never saw myself or heard myself speaking apart from inside my own head. And mm. so when suddenly everything went, you know, if I was working in a, in a venue, I was doing running workshops, I was doing improvisation, everything was, was external. And I think this is what's happened with lots of people. And now that they're looking at uh, creating in a different way is suddenly we are very comfortable seeing people on camera. We're very comfortable at seeing ourselves and listening to ourselves, which we never were before. You know, for me to suddenly turn up in a Zoom room four or five times a week and be able to see myself constantly was, you know, is was quite bizarre. And it took a while to get used to that. And I think that's that's something that everybody is getting quite comfortable with now that they that they weren't necessarily comfortable with before. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point that you don't start out being comfortable. I remember the first time I heard my own recorded voice. I was like, it's not how I sound. Like, what's going on? It's not how I sound at all. 
yes it is because the voice we have in our head that's us talking eg to ourselves is not the same voice that we articulate right how we articulate ourselves and it's the same when you see oh i don't like how i am on video that's only going to become a comfortable thing by doing it a load of times right by doing the numbers doing the reps the same with talking the same with anything and i think that for me that's the important bit because the pandemic was a very key example of a time where we were all locked inside our houses and we wanted to still communicate and have fun right basically was the crux so it's like how do we do that okay a way is to create funny videos right the amount of tiktok's successful stories that have come just from that period of time alone is because they started creating tiktoks as a way to kill the time while they were in lockdown right was a way and they were taking a not great situation you know and i think this is what we do as humans in life we tell our stories and we build our stories around personal interactions and personal events that happen you know and this is why it's really important to believe and trust and love yourself because you know and i know when you came on our show we discussed a lot around like how do you craft that story and i think that it's something which is important because that's why people are going to choose you that's why people are going to connect with you because you are able to be vulnerable you are able to share you are able to actually you're not just a blank slate like blank face i'm just going to distribute information to you you're going to do it in a fun dramatic entertaining educational entertaining and etc way to do that and you can that and then you can come across actually with your own personality and actually say yeah this is who i am actually but some people and be okay with the fact that some people aren't going to like that right you know i i'm surprised i haven't sworn as much as i usually do in this podcast but some people don't like the fact that i weave swearing into my content i'm like well i swear in reality so what i just cut it out of content and then you're surprised when you meet me and i'm swearing that's not integral to me So I'm doing myself a disjustice because if the swearing bit of it, you know, doesn't like or you don't like the fact I have hats on or I don't wear a hat, you know, subtle hint, there's a hat there, you know, (laughs) the other hat that I usually wear is there, right? For me, it's about, you know, someone doesn't like me because of my hat or the fact I wear a hat. Okay, well, maybe I'm not going to synergize or maybe I'm not going to work with them anyway. So let's just cut the crap out and let's move past that so i can just talk to the people i'm going to talk to and this kind of comes back to the kind of question of like do you have competitors or collaborators right because some people are going to be like yeah i work with people who i synergize with not necessarily the people who are better at the job i work with people who are synergized yeah you had to be good at the job anyway transactionally and and etc from a technical point of view like if i made bad videos wouldn't matter how good my personality is they still wouldn't make me money because they're bad but bad is a subjective thing. The style differences. If we're talking tech wise, they need to be to a certain level. But after that, it's just down to whose style do you like and who do you resonate with to get yeah. the products you want or need. Yeah. But you know, that is your you know, your video or your presentation is your calling card. It's your introduction. So if you come across as authentic, relatable, as you know, whatever that personality is, you will attract those people to you that want to work with you and then they can step into the website they can step into the you know what experience you've had how much work you've done who you've worked with all of those things so tell me a a little bit because I know obviously we're speaking at a time uh, not long after the passing of our dear queen um, and I know that during that sort of downtime when you know that couple of weeks when nobody quite knew what to do and there was all sorts of pomp and circumstance going on around us you went out with your camera and and took some film how did, how did that come about and what what made you do that i mean firstly it was just a very weird 10 days to be in business wasn't it it was just kind of like people were like i kind of want to be silly but i also just don't feel it's appropriate right now <laughs> like it just doesn't doesn't work and uh, you know i was just thinking uh, and for a long time and i'll give uh, so a little bit of background before i go into it but for me i was like okay shocked that the queens died like we knew that this was going to happen at some point right she's not going to live forever etc but it was just the suddenness i guess i suppose and then it was like i had this reaction that just wasn't something i was used to and i made it very clear in my own head and i was like okay should i do something should i not do something i don't really know because i think partly the brand from a sort of point of view is kind i'm kind of known for 
promoting Salisbury or showcasing Salisbury or, you know, having a Salisbury spin on world events kind of thing. Right. So I was like, right. Okay. But how do I do this? Cause I was like very kind of torn. I was like, I don't really want to make this bad because I get one shot of doing this properly. <laughs> and it's like, how do I do this in a, like, I want to cover it, but how do I do it in a way which is respectful? So uh, for me, long story short, anyway, that led on to firstly me deciding I wasn't going to do anything. Uh, and then my instincts kicked in after having a conversation with some photographers on the Friday and basically saying, look, I need to film. So I'm going to film this event that I was told about happening and then I'll decide later. Um, and what it led on to was me having a great conversation um, with a copywriter friend of mine. And he gave me the idea to say, well, why don't you try and get Salisbury to immortalize how they feel and tell the story for you? Because then you're not telling the story. Right. And so that's what I did. And I, I initially saw it as like a small little project that was like, OK, cool. This is going to be fun little views. And then we'll do like some of the other events that were taking place, like the proclaiming of the new king and, you know, minute silence of the queen and et cetera. But it just grew and grew and grew into this like mini kind of community based project where just more and more people kind of said, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then I just had like the reality kick in about like Monday or Tuesday of the following week during the period of mourning. And I was like, this is going to be one of those edits that's just never going to end, isn't it? Because it was just so much footage. And it was the largest project I've done in a very long time, but something that I'm very proud of to firstly be able to have done. So thank you to everyone who, if they're watching, thank you to everyone who actually helped do it. But also number two, to be able to immortalize the feeling during that period of time, because literally within like maybe one or two days after the funeral, people kind of was like, yeah, it was sad, but that's a last week problem kind of thing in the nicest way possible. And they were just like, I'm now back to work. So I kind of took an opportunity where it was like people weren't really making decisions regarding paying or like doing projects or not doing projects, etc. And quite a lot of people just pulled their marketing as well, like completely. They just went silent um, out of respect. And I was like, OK, well, how can I create something unique and special in this period of time I've now been given? Right. And this is just a perspective change that I'd recommend people think about whenever they have a situation which is like, oh, this might be a bit tight or, oh, I need to actually, you know, make something happen, so to speak. So, well, actually, how bad actually really is it? Are you going to be in a position where you don't have enough money to eat or, or buy food to eat? Right. Are you going to be in the position of you don't have a house to live in and be able to heat it, etc.? Right. These are really common factors that are being discussed at the moment. Right. But actually, if you are, it's a good thing to understand that's the reality that you're in. OK we are in that desperate reality. But if you're not, it's actually a very good perspective change on actually things aren't that, actually they're not that bad. Things actually aren't that bad. Yeah, it's a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, it's a bit not great right now. But actually they're not that bad. And so what what reaction were you getting from people being out there? And what, what, have, you, what have you done with the film since in terms of, of marketing that particular piece of, of video? Um, I, I mean, for me, like I was, I was debating a, a while as I, as I was building the film. I mean, answer the uh, the last question first, and what work was, um, of how do I, how do I put this out? Because you kind of really, when you do a film like that, you kind of have a one chance to really put it out. Um, and for me, I was like, how can I put it in such a way where it's going to be seen by the most people possible. Because when you make a film like that, you want it to be seen as many people as possible. Not necessarily saying that everyone is going to watch all of it because there's going to be natural drop off on a 40 minute doc like that. There just is. But how can I put it in the peripheral way of where people are going to consume content? So I could have gone down the approach of, I'm just going to put it on YouTube. Um, it is on YouTube, but I could, I was just going to put it on YouTube. And that's the only place you can see the full thing and then create a trailer on all the others to then push to YouTube. But the problem is with that is you're going to get maybe 20%, maybe 30%, if you're lucky, click through from the trailers into YouTube. And for me, I was like, that's kind of doing the film a disservice because if I don't, like, that's why, and there's some limiting factors, like, for example, you can't put a 30-minute film or 40-minute film on LinkedIn solely, right? So, but I could on Facebook. So in regards to distribution, I put it on Facebook and I put it on YouTube as the full films. And I then made a trailer of, of it pointing out to where you could watch the full thing. And I put that on all the other socials. I'll be honest. I was actually surprised by people's reaction from an immortalization point of view in regards to like what they said, because I kind of expected there to be a level of kind of like Colton is a monarchist and Colton is, 
you know, that or, or Colton trying to push that narrative. But the thing was, it actually wasn't. It was around and uh, what I wanted for the film, which is which is got why I'm really glad that that's what happened. Is it was immortalizing Queen Elizabeth II, not let's have a conversation around the monarchy as a whole. It was actually outside of that, if that makes sense. And I think for me, because of the legacy she had and because of how long she reigned for, and the fact that you know the vast majority of the UK has only known her, right? Because unless you're above the age of 70, you won't know anyone else. You we were all able, and it kind of there was a level of like kind of high level of community that kind of came together to be like, yeah, this is kind of our chance to say our final goodbye kind of thing. And that's what it felt like. And I'm, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that I I I was able to immortalize that and and sort of be able to immortalize that forever. It wasn't really let's get it loads of views now. That was never the point. The point was you know, let's have this piece. So in four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I can look back on it and say that was a moment in history that I was able to capture. Yes. You docu- you documented that, that moment in time. And that's, I'm sure, you know, going forward will be exactly what it was for. So that's, that's brilliant. So where can people find that piece of film if they want to watch it? Um, so it's on our Facebook page, uh, Brunner Media on Facebook and the same on YouTube. So the full full docs are both there. Um, or you can just literally just go onto YouTube and write in Salisbury's uh, Salisbury honors Queen Elizabeth II and it'll be the top result. Um, because YouTube is a search engine, as we've come full back circle. Uh, YouTube yeah. is a search engine. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, before we wrap up, let's just uh have a look for those that are watching. This is uh this is your website www.bruntonmedia.com and what can people find there Carlton? Um, so on the website is uh, examples of our work our, obviously our various services pages so there's recently just been added a coaching page um, and also then obviously the video production page and soon to be added our repurposing page which is taking something like this and turning it into social media chunks and uh, they're more sales pages but they literally just walk you through what our processes are like for those who may be interested in having that conversation and also at the bottom of each of those pages is a way to book directly into my calendar so that we can have a conversation about your needs whatever whatever that whatever that is whether that's coaching video production or or soon to be the repurposing brilliant um and then on linkedin for those that want to follow you connect with you are you happy to people for people to reach yeah, out to yeah, you absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So that's linkedin.com and Carlton Brunton. Just uh, go go find him there. Brilliant. Oh, thank you so much for your time today, Carlton. It's been really interesting. Lots and lots of valuable content in there for people looking at either starting on their video journey or just looking at a reason why they should continue. Because, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes I think people do get get a bit sort of oh is this happening? What what am I meant to be doing with this? So I think that's yeah, it is, is their marketing working, right? Like just as a final thought. If you are doing marketing at the moment, think, what is it doing for you? Why is it doing? Why are you doing it? Because yeah. now more than ever is a time to really audit what you're doing. What's it doing for you? Is yeah. it a direct sales contributor? Okay, great, cool. Is it a brand builder? Okay, great, cool. If you don't know, let's have that conversation. Yep, yeah, and I'm going to piggyback on the back of that and say, do the same if you've got a presentation or public speaking coming up because it's exactly the it's exactly the same. What is it doing for your personal brand, and how are you using video or public speaking as part of your marketing strategy? Which I think is what it, it really comes down to. So brilliant! Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your week, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me.